Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness. Foolishness. Well, guys, what is going on? This is Brian Sumner. Welcome to episode 88 of the Foolishness Podcast. It's 2021. There's so much going on. I got to confess, I've done three podcasts in a row, three days in a row. I'm sitting on this wooden bench. It's not feeling too good. I jumped up early to get connected with my guest today. I am excited to have on. I'll intro him as the man he is. He's a husband, father, a very acclaimed musician, a skater, which is very important, a lover of the word of God and King Jesus, and has actually pastored on and off many times. So it's going to be a fun episode today. Say hello to Josh Garrels. How you doing, brother? Good, good. Thanks for having me, man. Of course. I know our story is kind of crazy because we know all the same people. I mean, like Josh White. Uh, Tim Mackey, you're really good friends with Josh Harmony. And I can't tell you how many events I was almost going to speak at or skate at, and you would be on. I'd be like, okay, we finally get to connect, and we never did. So we are literal Instagram buddies, but here we are today as Zoom buddies. This is as close as we'll get. So (laughs) (laughs) That's right, man. But how's everything going? You're good? Good, good. Just sitting in here in what we call our quiet time room in the house. This is where my wife wakes up at five in the morning with coffee and uh, okay, and what it's her mindset is, before the kids wake up. I think we're three hours. You are okay. It's like two o'clock. I think we're three hours ahead of you. Okay, yeah. it's it's what it's ten here, and everyone's up but kind of chilling in the rooms. I'm actually in the ah, kitchen because okay. it catches the sound. But yeah. the reason I really wanted to have this on is just that. You've had this crazy life, crazy career. I mean, we're going to go wherever today. But yeah. even looking into your music, I mean, some of these songs are getting 19, 20 million listens on Spotify. You've got, what, nine, ten albums. I seen even yesterday or today you dropped a single, His Wings. So yep. I'd say just start. Um, where is Josh Garrels right now in life jumping on this podcast? I mean, you've had this prolific career. <laughs> the Lord's beginning to shape you in 2021 as hopefully as many, many yeah. of maybe the lukewarm Christians who've just been casually going have said, wow, the world is turning. But for people like yourself, who've kind of had pedal to the metal for decades. Yeah. Um, what's the Lord just doing with you? Let's just start right there in the deep end. Yeah. 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 No, I said, I said yes to this podcast too, because in, in many ways I've had, like, as you said, pedal to the metal, sort of my, Mm -hmm. hyper focus is like the creation of songs and music that's what what i love to do and often that takes precedence over so many other things Mm -hmm. but you know as we chat a little bit before this 2021 literally this month marks the beginning of Mm -hmm. a sabbatical season of rest i don't totally know what the parameters are around that Mm -hmm. beyond it's just kind of like taking my foot off the gas a little bit with uh, music and some of these endeavors that um I love, but they're also, they get so intertwined with finances. Yeah. And I mean, you were part of the skateboarding world, man. So, you yep. know, just the, when your job is seemingly dependent on how present you are, if mm-hmm. you're at the contest, if you're at the demo, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like yeah. and that equaling sponsors and the whole thing is like a big ecosystem that feeds on whether or not you're like mm. pushing it and killing it or not. You know what yeah. I mean? And music isn't that far from that model you know yeah. what i mean like, no, I've, heard, I've heard the willie nelson song on the road again because yeah. he's always on the road again he's got to yeah. keep going <laughs> that's you've right been, you've been avid for i mean how many years has it been like 16 17 that you've been a lot of years man a lot of years wow but to, to answer your question yeah maybe a little more um in depthly or something i yeah. just i just drove my mother-in-law back to north carolina she came and stayed with us for like a full month and um, I like drove down, picked her up, mm. drove her back and forth. It's a four day trip both ways. Wow. And, uh, so a lot of time to sit and think on the road. And I like a friend recommended this book, old book by this dude named Bobby Clinton, just about mm. like the phases in like a leader's life. But I mean, yeah. you don't have to be one who considers yourself a leader to glean something from this book. Really, it could just mm-hmm. be the phases of spiritual development with anyone who's like trying to follow the Lord, you yeah. know? And it goes through these very like sort of definite stages um, coming into the faith. You know what I mean? Having um, a leader that's leading you because before Christ, no one was leading me. No one was leading you. I was just kind of dreaming it up and taking the cues from the world as I went. 
Um, but then early years of, of ministry, and even as you alluded to, the pedal mm-hmm. to the metal, you can look at those as almost like your hunger years where yeah, yeah. you have seemingly like limitless energy. <laughs> you're stoked, you're zealous, you're pushing in. Doors, I mean, doors even open up for you. I think the Lord yeah. utilizes that like the young man's strength. And Almost the, young the man's, zeal, the, the hoots yeah, to the Jews. Yeah. And like courage and longing for adventure, longing to have your life mean something, take the bull by the horns, hungry, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it, you know. And in the book that falls right in the, like what they would call stage three of one's development, <laughs> which is hungry, hungry. Yeah. And the few other talks I've given, I've, I've alluded to this, but this book actually helped put more words to it which is there's a point Mm. when your energy maybe starts giving out or um sickness is brought into your life or Mm. you're put into a season of isolation for some reason or you just hit a point where you're like i've worked really hard i've accomplished Mm -hmm. this much those around me are applauding what's been accomplished yeah but when you're real with yourself you start saying if I have to expend this amount of energy to continue this, I don't think I can mm. do it. Yeah. Um, the return doesn't line up with how much effort you're putting in. That's yeah. right. But yeah. also like spiritually looking at the scripture, there's a point at which mm. you're realizing like, I long for this life with the Lord to be what scripture says it's supposed to be mm. um, to experience the things Amen. it's saying that we're supposed to experience to um, enter into the fullness of a life with Christ. Mm. Um, and so you look all through history and you have like, man, virtually anyone who's led a significant organization, denomination, yeah, awakening has done mm. work that's been so fruitful that they're still writing books about it. Usually that season of their life starts at the moment at which they're at the end of themselves. And that's been years of me just reading biographies and spiritual biographies. And <laughs> it seems like there's this crisis moment where they've, you know, they're maybe middle-aged, mm-hmm. they've put in a lot of years of hard work, but they're disillusioned. Something's giving out, you yeah. know what I mean? They're realizing I can't move forward in this manner anymore. And mm-hmm. strangely enough, those have been like the exact words that I've been saying sort of, for a few years it's like man i'm so thankful for all that's happened the opportunities i've been given i wouldn't take any of it back yeah yet i i just happened to reach this threshold where you're like but i can't continue that way any longer wow and part of the longing is like the lord's actually calling me through to something different i don't Mm -hmm. totally know what it looks like yet Um, (laughs) which in in the the world's eyes seems like okay well you have this quarter life crisis idea or even if we get older midlife crisis but really biblically god is just maybe like hey You've cast so much into this. And I mean, you know, I think the first time I heard your music, I was on a plane with Josh Harmony about Mm -hmm. to go to New Zealand and you guys were connecting him and Eric Cole. And I heard Mm -hmm. Father Along and I was like, wait, this is a white guy that's singing this. And I I listened to the song like 50 times. And Mm -hmm. then I got into so much of the music and the prolific songwriting and music playing and the gift that you have. It's all there. And we're thankful for that, Lord. But in this season, you're almost like, okay, God, I feel like there's something else that you're pushing me into maybe like that wilderness withdrawal just to see what he has next. I mean, it's not through conflict. It's just like a natural progression that you're saying I'm willing to embrace. So, okay. You're about to step over the threshold. Now you feel like, well, yeah, it's been, if I'm honest, I wish it was just like this moment where this thing happened, (laughs) but I feel like it's been a few years of like slowly, like, okay, I guess I'm going to like put this thing down now. I guess I'm going to uh, free my time up in this way. Um, I guess I'm yeah. not going to tour as much, you know, sort of setting things down, which then all of a sudden is creating like sort of internal margin to actually begin mm. to imagine something else. So I will say, I think in the future, music's going to be part of my life. Yeah. But yet I think they're even has to, at this moment for this year, be a little setting down of even the thing that I love most and be like, I'm here, you know? Hmm. um again to say that that book i was listening yeah. to so then moving into stage four that threshold in one's life is from the ministry of doing you know those hungry years to the ministry that comes out of just being mm-hmm. where you 
you begin to own that scripture in Galatians where it says, mm-hmm. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You know, the life I now live, I live through faith in the son of God. And mm-hmm. I've said this for months. That sounds really poetic. We may have read that verse hundreds or thousands of times in our life, yeah. but I'm convinced that that's actually a reality to be moved into. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Just this it's morning. living reading, word. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, man. Just this morning, I was reading, uh, what was it? My utmost for his highest, you know, mm-hmm. classic morning devotional. Oswald in Chambers there, for listeners, yeah. Yeah, Oswald Chambers. I think it was that. I read a couple in the morning. I think it was my utmost where he talks about your white funeral and the white funeral being a death you go through while living, which mm-hmm. is moving into um, really like deeper surrender you know, mm-hmm. deeper surrender, which is ultimately sort of a new death to yourself, but so that like the life of Christ can yeah, be lived in your life in, in a greater capacity. So I think mm-hmm. I've just grown tired of maybe the governor that I've been putting on how much the resurrected life is able to uh, be present. You know what I mean? Like, I do think you feel I've like it's been that. that. Do you feel like it's been not like flesh, but you feel like almost the music career and all that has been so much like you navigating it where maybe God's now like, hey, because because how old are you, Josh? You're just turned 40, man. OK, so do, let's just talk about 40. You know, you want to write a book about that. I mean, <laughs> not, right. not, not about our back and our arms and our legs and all the strumming, but biblically, yep. I mean, Moses, Israel, I mean, what God did at 40, you know, most yep. of these ministries aside from Jesus, I mean, the apostles were young, you know, young men, really, what, possibly 16 to, to 30, yes. want to be crazy. But 40 is when, you know, Moses tried to do it his way, <laughs> ended up getting into all kinds of trouble, left to go into the wilderness, thought he was forgotten. Not that Josh Garrell's been forgotten at all, but I'm saying, you mentioned being the no. governor, maybe you've been like, hey, here's what I've just been doing. Yes, in the Lord, but... Yep. is where I am. And God, what do you have? And, and man, and you've mentioned even prior, you'd been a pastor before you've preached before. Have you ever mm-hmm. thrown that out? Or have you been like, Lord, you just, whatever you have for me, I'm willing to go there. Yeah. yeah. Whatever he has, I'm willing, man. So really, stage what... four is threshold. And like, are you trying to hear God? Just, just as you lay things down, are you seeing him put things in front of you? Is that why you're like, I'm going to go on this podcast and just yeah. eat this, the fruit of it or yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, going on this podcast, you wrote me, you're like, Hey man, what do you want to talk about? No answer on my end. <laughs> the next time, Hey man, what do you want to talk about? And no answer on my end. Cause I don't, I don't totally know, but I would, I've had a sense, like, I think the Lord will just like lead this conversation. Yeah. And I think there's something to, yeah. Him giving us what we need to talk about in the moment. Mm-hmm. Cause I know that beneath the surface in me and in you, there are things that are like, bubbling there are things he's putting together so even before Mm -hmm. i came in here me and my wife we prayed like lord just man lead this conversation into something that is actually like fruitful for the listener you know well because anyone would look at your position and you being the governor you could say if you were the beatles even though they were together for seven years if they hadn't split up you would say oh you just drive this thing into the ground i seen that you know bg special and they did that thing the whole life well you're just girls you have a guitar you have a voice this is what I'm meant to do. But instead you're like, you know what, babe, to your wife, let's just lay this on the altar. Not because it's an idol. You've definitely handed it back to the Lord. I mean, I hear theology. I hear love for Christ. I know people view the music as worship and your Mm -hmm. style of music. When you're not sitting in a church playing for people to say that about your music, when it's just played in the radio, that says a lot of your focus, Mm -hmm. you know, these bands like Leland and Phil Wickham and the rest. So listeners be praying for Josh, for his family, you know, what chapter have you finished the book yet? Is there a chapter five? I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it goes on to like different phases. I think it's for anyone who wants to listen, it's it's free on Audible. Okay, if you have wow. an Audible membership. Yeah, yeah. Um wow. But I, I did have to admit when it went on to like later phases, it's one I knew intuitively. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not there yet. You know, this doesn't mm. totally make sense. The the transition from sort of a life of doing. Yeah. And like, man, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make this life count with the time I have. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, that's been sort of my mantra for years is like, mm-hmm. let's make it count. We only have so much time. Let's make this fruitful. Let's push yeah. in. Let's create. Let's get out there. Let's talk <laughs> to people, you know, to this place of like, you know, what? I'm going to be still and mm-hmm. trust that perhaps he could do more through me by just waiting on him than me 
putting out six albums next year. You know what I mean? Yeah, me yeah. maybe doing nothing. Perhaps mm. there's more that happens from me this year being in his presence than me making six albums. Because mm. honestly, what's been hard is like I endlessly have ideas. So I probably have three albums that have just like been in the hopper waiting for me to like wow. start hammering them out. And yeah. it's, it's it's me right now saying no to that. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do it. I mean, like those have to go on the shelf. And sorry, listeners, if you wanted to hear those albums, like I need to like, yeah be sort of obedient to sitting still for a moment Mm. and really really listening you know so we're not saying josh is done with music he's retired this is it what josh is saying is you're a worshiper i mean you're gonna pick that guitar up or whatever probably every day and mess around and whatever with the kids but so you did just you released his wings yesterday or today today so these are this is stuff i finished last year that sort of got put in the queue for music release and Mm. so it's getting released now which is kind of weird that i'm like in this year where i'm not actively doing anything but yeah so i just released that today (laughs) and what's it about (laughs) obviously on his wings you know yeah yeah yeah. so it's this little ep that's coming out in two weeks is like the lead single for it you know um it's the second installment to all this work i had years ago that Mm. i just buried a lot of it due to like uh you know, I grew up listening to hip hop. So yeah. a lot of it had sampled music in it. That and makes sense stuff. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just like buried all my first albums. And so this album coming out is like new versions of old songs where mm. like his wings, I've taken these songs I wrote years and years ago. Wow. As sort of like a brand new Christian. And then like fully produced them last year, like took my guys in the studio and be like, Hey, let's like let's produce this song, you know? So I took eight of my old <laughs> songs and did like sort of full production. And so but you didn't change the lyrics or anything, or you, were you looking back like, Oh, this was cringe. I was, you know, 20. Um, I'd or say you... 98% is exactly the way I wrote it. Wow. There are some things in there that I was like, you know, I don't, I don't really want to say that. <laughs> That's not my theology right now. I'm not weeping yeah. on, a, on a couch like somewhere. <laughs> That's right. That's right, man. That's right. Wow. So you're just yeah. literally, okay, whatever's this year. And you'd mentioned potentially, you know, if the Lord has you doing a podcast, you've met so many people. Um, but when, one of the things I was curious too, because even seeing someone as talented as Josh Harmony and amazing and gifted, you were there in the season when you kind of went from album royalties and everyone was able to be a musician to albums just getting taken everywhere. And you began mm-hmm. to just tour, right? It became, because some of the questions even I noticed saying you were on were like, what led Josh to be this touring artist who began to give his music away and then spend more time on the road? I mean, that's someone that you've depended on a certain income. And then you're going to just say, I'm willing, how did that all transition for you as as a husband and everything as well? Like touring more or touring less? Well, basically saying I'm releasing my music and then I'm going to go on the road to get it out more. You were one of those pioneers at that time that I remember seeing like, okay, you just released everything, you know, which means you're making, yeah. Yeah. So for those listening who aren't familiar with my story, which could be quite a few people, is Mm -hmm. I think around 2010, 2011, I made this 18 song album called Love and War and the scene in between took me like a year and a half to make this thing. And I mean, that was a period where we just had our second kid. Mm -hmm. We were barely able to pay our rent in Portland, Oregon. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? I was making this album in essentially what was a porch that was off our main bedroom. Wow. They put some windows in. So it was like, I had this little porch. <laughs> I was in there like literally just like making this album that I knew was sort of like grand in its scope, you mm-hmm. know? And I poured a lot of myself and blood, sweat and tears into the into this album. It really, um, mm. looking back now, it was one of those like high points in my career. You know what I mean? That album in particular, yeah. what it ended up Amazing going album. on to do, you know? So all that to say, I put in all this time and energy into this, into this album. Nearing the completion of it, I lost my voice for three months. Um, so I was just praying, like, Lord, I need a voice. What's going mm. on? No answer. I still haven't I got prayed. my voice yet. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can't sing for anything. So. <laughs> That's right, if man. I step over the threshold and he gives me your voice, I'm good to go for a few years. But, That's right. But you lost your voice. Go on. Yeah, yeah. So the album was almost done but I hadn't had my voice to do the final lyrics, man. So the album itself, all the music is almost done, but I Mm. haven't recorded my vocals. And I remember like 
so clearly I was sitting in the bath, having like a prayer bath with candles and stuff, you know, and, uh, <laughs> just for your visualization, you know? And I like, I prayed, it was like, I prayed this thing that in hindsight, it was just one of those cliche yeah. things you say in prayer that you don't even necessarily expect. Yeah. You're not going with any expectancy. I was just sitting there in the bath and I was like, Lord, I just pray you'd have the glory or whatever, you know? Yeah. yeah. And he like broke into he broke into the dialogue right there. And as much as you can say, I heard the voice of God immediately when I said that, he uh. said, well, then well, then give it to me in answer to me praying like, Lord, I just pray you'd have the glory. And, you know, just have the glory. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I felt the weight of him saying, well, then give it to me. Hmm. Which I sounds exactly like God. And I sat there quiet for wow. minutes, man. Like, and it's almost, if you've ever had just like a download from the Lord, I don't get these very often, but he definitely like gave me a download of what mm -hmm. that meant. It was all impressed on me. And I knew mm -hmm. it was giving him the glory meant like the album was his, the income was his. Wow. And once I realized that, you know, I've been working for a year and a half and we can barely pay our rent. And I have this thing that I know is going to like equal us being paid back and filling in the hole of debt and paying for yeah. my kids diapers you know what i mean the whole thing yeah he's like give me give me the album give me the give me the revenue and i sat there quietly without answering him because wow. i had this sense that whatever however i respond to this verbally i'm bound to that <laughs> that answer you know wow and finally i was like all right all right i'll give it to you um that's heavy and one once again for those listening this is 2010 so this is pre-spotify you know what i mean yeah. this is pre-music being free from the cloud like artists depend on people buying the mp3 on itunes CDs, and yeah. cd sales yeah i mean yeah. those were still a big deal you know and so it was like giving all that away wow um, that's a that's a mate and and then when you told your wife you're like babe i've got some good and bad news but i've left the bath with the candles just go in there god wants to talk to you <laughs> that's right and she you came know, up. I went out kind of freaked out so when i <laughs> when i said yes to him verbally then he like gave me the next you know hmm. st stages three four five of that decision he said one year you give it away you give away all the revenue for a wow. year wow and i was like all right one year we'll do it and then he brought that the sort of storyline from J the book of Joshua, you know, when they go into the promised land and there's the sin of Achan where he mm -hmm. like, after Jericho, he takes some of the spoil and he buries it and he brings like a curse upon all Israel because he yeah. doesn't do what the Lord said. He said, destroy it all. And so he sort of put that word on my mind too. Like, okay, you're committing to this, like give it away, you know? Wow. Right. Went out and told my wife expecting her to be like tearful in a bad way. Like we're going to be living on government cheese, but God says it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, man. <laughs> she tears amazing. up and just starts smiling. And she's like, yeah, I, that's the right. That's right. That's what we're going to do. You know? Wow. Long story short as I give it away. Um, it was just at that point where you could like give away MP3s through various sites, noise trade, mm -hmm. band camp. You could like give away download albums, which was a really big deal then. Cause it yeah. was like, to get an album for free, even at 2010, was sort of a big deal, you know. Yeah, they were always 10 bucks, 12.99, 14.99. Yeah, the doubles were 20 bucks. So I remember it because it was like just releasing all this music, and Josh Harmony's like, "Yeah, this is just feeling the way the Lord's leading." So yeah, man. Yeah. So that year, I think I gave away about 85,000 albums. We paid off all of our personal debt. We bought a house, and this is all after giving away. I think we gave away thirty to forty thousand dollars in like income that came from people who still wanted to go to iTunes and buy the thing, you know. Wow. So all that money we were just finding organizations or churches or missionaries and just kind of like wow, giving all the revenue away along with giving away almost a hundred thousand albums. And then by the end, it was like scripture yeah. says, like test me and see, man. And I'll like <laughs> I'll pour it in your lap and it'll overflow. And so yeah. at the end of that year, man. That's crazy. I didn't expect it. Okay. I didn't expect it. Like shows are selling out all of a sudden 500 people are coming to shows instead of a hundred, which means all of a sudden we have money to put a down payment on a house and we paid <laughs> off all our debt. So that all happened literally at the end of that year where he said, That's... give it away and sort of kickstarted this new yeah. 
found career and trajectory. So since then, I've sort of committed to, even though it's not a big deal to give away music anymore, I've still like sort of committed to like, Lord, how can I, with each yeah. release, how can I give it away in a way that's generous? That's not. You go buy some candles and say, babe, I'll be out in a few hours. I want to hear what God's doing. You know, you're going to get a load <laughs> of messages right. now, like, Josh, I was in the bath. And then you're like, no, 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 scroll down a paragraph or two. <laughs> that's right. Well, here's the thing, right? So, I know as someone that raises support full time, which is crazy, I remember, you know, kind of the tail end of my skate career. There's a couple of points I really could have made that might encourage you or others. But I remember just coming to faith and it was like the Lord just took my skate career and just switched it. Like, mm-hmm. listen, I mean, you were around the generation I was skating a lot, right? You would have seen the magazines mm-hmm. and the videos yeah. and, you know, you're jumping on 10, 12, I mean, 15, 16 the handrails, you're you're not training, but you're skating four or five hours a day. I literally came to faith and it was like, I remember being in a church in Westminster, the sanctuary and just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do with my skating? And I felt like God said, and it's funny. I don't really hear people use the word impressed, but I always use that word to, to deliver what I feel like the Lord's saying, you know, some guy Mm -hmm. will say in old English, touch stay at the Lord or someone will say, Hey, does this mean something to you? But for me, it was this impression, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And I was mm-hmm. like, but Lord, the verses take off your sandals. And God obviously knows what, you know, it originally says in the Hebrew, but it was like he was saying, Brian, and I just knew it all at once. You're going to focus on the word and, and just being an evangelist. And as these people in the industry look to what you're doing, they're going to see your walk with me. They're going to see your marriage restored. And um, I didn't know I'd go on, you know, really travel as much and pastor and put a book out and be doing this. But I just knew the Lord was like, this was it. And what's crazy was, there was a certain amount of money in the bank. I just was like, well, I'm going to ride these sponsors out, ride for a couple of Christian brands. I use that money to kind of live off. But mm-hmm. when my church said, you need to step out as an evangelist, you know, if we put you on staff, you'd be like a caged tiger just sitting here wanting to go out at lunchtime and evangelize everyone. And you want to be around the world. And that's, that's kind of the way God made me. So mm-hmm. I'm saying this to make this point as I literally was like, okay, Lord, First Corinthians 9, 14, God commands those who do the work of the gospel, make the living from it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to step out. The second I stepped out and people actually partnered, I remember being in like Alaska in the snow, waking up in the morning. And since you're talking about baths, you know, getting out the shower. And I just had this like, wow, Lord, you are bringing people to partner with me so I can go do this. You're mm-hmm. actually le- and why I'm saying that is because now when Josh Garrels goes to play a show and there's 500 people, you must have been carrying. I gave this all away and you, you've opened this door mm-hmm. and it must have been different the way you viewed the Lord, even when you sang songs, right? Yeah. Because it yeah. is about his glory to those who are listening. God does love Josh and me. I mean, it, it, he, we are the object of his affection, but it's all about God's glory. And when you lay yeah. it there. God's really going to, he can do whatever he wants, but it's very different to be submitted to what he's doing than him almost bending the arm at times. So how was it then traveling and writing and what was next? Did you just feel a different reverence for God or? Yeah. Yeah. As I've looked back at that point and point since, and I would say even what I'm going through now Mm -hmm. is interestingly, for me, I feel like the creative process, music, for so long has been intertwined with my faith process. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course I'm human. So like any, there are times that those can uh, be not working together to be at odds, but ultimately it's this thing that I feel like I've been made to do. So what I learn through music often is so intertwined with uh, Mm -hmm. my faith process. So like laying it down like that. Yeah was actually hugely purifying to Mm -hmm. my relationship with music itself, Mm. which was very purifying to like my faith and my walk with the Lord. Cause I think anytime again, that we're like surrendering and saying, you know, like Isaac with his son, like, wow, thank you for the promise child. Now I going to take him up on the mountain. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that was, he loved his son. Mm -hmm. The son was promised him but he was willing even to lay that down and he's the father of faith because there's something yeah. about that, like the Lord gives and then we like give it back. Give it and back. again, that's one of those things that sounds really Christian-y poetic, like, Oh, just give it to the Lord, man. Just, you know, <laughs> cast your crowns at his feet, which is awesome. 
but I think there are things he brings into our life that are like, mm. will you, will you set this thing down and trust me, you know, mm-hmm. um, and yeah. letting the outcome be what the outcome will be. Mm. And so every time that he's led me through those, sometimes those are little crossroads where there's a yeah. decision I have to make, like, wow, like, am I going to work with this publicist? I don't have good feelings about it. It feels mm-hmm. gross. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out of that. Mm pull out of that thing I thought I was going to do and lose five grand. Cause I think using yeah. a publicist is wrong for me. And yeah. so that's a little crossroad. Then there are bigger crossroads where it's like, will you, will you let go of that? Will you set that down? Hmm. And I think for all your listeners, like what we need to remember, what I need to remind myself is that every time that I've actually followed through with yep. something that he's asking me to set down, it comes with, Oh man, like liberation, mm. peace, <laughs> rest, it purifies the, it purifies the thing that he's asking you to set down yeah oh man and it like leads you forward in your journey with him and so it's, so it's a wonder we would cling to anything but we still do i still have things and i i know for a fact that i'm like he's sort of like wrestling it out of my hands you know, I'm like, <laughs> you know yeah well, i like that what you didn't list was you know, if I do this, God multiplies it tenfold. And then God had me build this back house and then God put a pool in and God can do all those things, but you listed spiritual things. And to our listeners, you know, you might be a musician. You could be like, man, if I could just get on that stage and then a year later be on the middle stage and then five years be on the main stage, those things aren't bad in and of themselves. It's not bad to want to be a pro skater, to want to be the best accountant, to want to be president, though I wouldn't recommend it nowadays. But the Mm -hmm. point is that, Biblically, what this is called is a korban. You know, you set something apart when you say, hallow be your name. And mm-hmm. I love that you kind of are making fun, but being truthful in like, you know, it's one of those Christian kind of things, because we do say a lot of stuff. You'll see all those Christian skits on YouTube, you know, things Christians say. Yeah. Say, I'm laying this down is very different than saying, Lord, just use my life, do whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had to get out that bath and say, okay, I'm going to verbally tell my wife this. And there's the liberation. You know, and yep. she was like, well, I'm coming under Josh's covering. I mean, we're in this together, you know, mutually submitted to the Lord. And then God's goal, it isn't that he gives you this abundance in what you want. It's that he leads you into, I mean, to me, this podcast is already rich in a guy that could just be saying, if I churn out even three albums this year and keep all the uh, income and get more pride, but instead you're like, Lord, I'm releasing it. And that might mm-hmm. be speaking to someone right there that's to do with, you know, their marriage could be to do with their business going into this year. How many good friends do we have who they get the entrepreneurial word thrown at them all day? And yeah. the idea that money never sleeps, it becomes an obsession. And you yeah. could be like, well, what if I just got 20 million downloads for every song? Or Brian, yeah. what if you got, you know, the number one bigger than Joe Rogan? I mean, the reason why I'm in this white background and I really don't put a lot of focus on all the bells and whistles, I'm saying, as a podcaster with everything is I'm like, Lord, if there's people on that love you, they're going to help people. They're going to reach people. And if your words being spoken, you're going to be glorified. So yeah, there yeah. it is. And so, yeah, man. so then you're in a stage now where, so that transition happened and you said, okay, Lord, you obviously don't resent music. You love it. And um, what were some of your influences? You said hip hop, but I mean, what was your music growing up? I mean, who's your, like, if we're driving, we're going to go drop your mother-in-law off. What are we listening to? Oh, if my, if my mother-in-law's in the car? No, you and me. We're doing... <laughs> if your mother-in-law's in the car. Oh, man. These days, I don't even know. I mean, when I was a kid, it was all my dad's LPs. So, I mean, yeah, classic, yeah. you know, Beatles, okay. Led, Led Zeppelin, so the more Simon rock Garfunkel. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I have two older sisters. So, in the 90s, you know, back before grunge, there was alternatives, you know. So, I mean, I grew up listening to Pixies and the Smiths and all that stuff. Yeah. And then started skateboarding and all the dudes I skated would listen to punk rock. So, it was like then switching to bad religion and operation ivy and that's sort yeah. of that early no effects sort of skate punk epitaph stuff yeah for all like middle school basically it was just yeah nothing but punk rock then in high school i got high for the first time and heard hip-hop heard nas and it was immediate overnight i was like represent what? you know i like i loved the beats man so yeah. I mean, it was all the way through high school into college i was like that that like late yeah. 90s josh kalis josh kalis hip-hop skate. so that's <laughs> you who know? you were you were the josh kalis tray flip back nose blunt guy with the baggy camos can't say i could do a tray flip back nose blunt but <laughs> no i wasn't you... i wasn't i wasn't that street i always had like this 
there was a hippie side to me always, you know, like iPath. Remember iPath in the early 2000s? Sort of yeah. like the Matt Field, hippie, Matt Pales. hippie hip hop. Yeah, man. That was like my <laughs> vibe, you know, because I mean, I dealt drugs in high school. And so there was like that hippie, hip hop, skateboarder. But then yeah. like coming to faith, yeah. All of a sudden I realized I like to sing, you know. I mean, I was yeah. so even when I was like totally wayward in high school, I was like still in like choir and in choir to like use yeah and i was a choir wow. boy you know man so like i was still in choir and i would like be at home figuring out how to use like four track recorders and learning to play instruments so that was always still there you know mm -hmm. i've said this before yeah this is a thought i don't want to build upon someday i feel like there's something to it but yeah. for me i honestly think pre-salvation music was so important it was literal like with skateboarding was like full on yeah. identity, whatever yeah. music you're into. It's like a very defined subculture. Man. Of course I mean, it think is. about yeah. skateboarding, man. If someone's posing, you know it and they don't mm -hmm. understand the, the nuances of the culture and you can yeah. spot it a mile away. And you're like that, like skateboarding was like that music was like that to me. Mm -hmm. So if I was into like hip hop or punk rock, there's like, you learn the rules, you learn the dress, you like, you learn, the there's culture. a code yeah it's, it, there's it's a code you I, learn it and i was really good at like learning the code and winning yeah yeah and i'm gonna and say this this is gonna be funny because <laughs> when we were in the kitchen yesterday for whatever reason my wife said when i dress it's not unless le <laughs> it's not unless than guess and that's a nas lyric right yeah and <laughs> and you know what for some reason my my youngest son uh, my oldest, he listens to everything, you know, more Smith style, my daughter, yep. anything. But my youngest just loves hip hop and rap. He yep. sings these these Christian rap songs that have so much theology. And he'll hear yeah, about yeah. these people on TV and he'll know these songs about false preachers and he'll he'll say certain words about expiation wow. and stuff. And, you know, he's, he's 10, but I'm like, he's not going to realize what he knows till he gets older. That's right. But what's funny is, when I met my wife, she was very into, you know, straight edge, hardcore music and growing up in Huntington and so much music, but she never really listened to rap. And I was never like a rap guy, but, you know, living with Andrew Reynolds, Jim Greco, Jim came over from Connecticut. It was Mob Deep and all this rap. Andrew yeah. and them, it was loving Wu-Tang because definitely your generation when the Dan Wolf, Eastern Exposure, Sub-Zero videos came out, Stevie Williams, Josh Kalis, they had all this yeah. music. And yeah. so I'm saying that because though I'm useless with a guitar, I'll play an hour to a day watching TV or I love lyrics. There was yeah. just something about the way, and that's probably why I, I love the word of God because I just love how things can be explained. But yeah. when I did some of this, when I heard Nas and the way he he wrote, I couldn't believe it. You know, when I heard like Pac and Biggie, and I know everyone thinks of the drugs and the shootings and the craziness. I'm not affirming these lifestyles, but I'm saying you could see their gift. You know, you could see yeah. the even someone like Eminem, you know, I mean, you could see their ability and yeah. it was crazy. So your favorite Nas album would be. Oh, the first man, Illumatic first. for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then you were the fresh kind of skater kid. Josh Kalis, those guys. You know. <laughs> yeah. So what board do you have now? Like a DGK um, or you have your own board now? I've got my own board, actually. My buddy Sam yeah. Cook on yeah. his uh, Life Skate Shop in Muncie. Yep. And he like, man, he presses his own. So here's the thing. I'd never yeah. had like a boutique deck, man. I grew up going to the skate shop by the $50 yeah. thing and <laughs> it breaks. You know, you lose the pop in the tail in yeah. like a week or something, you know. Dude, there's something about like a boutique pressed deck. Yeah. Like yeah. he kept telling me about it. And like inwardly, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a deck, man. And he's yeah. like, no, just try, try this. And so he like set one up <laughs> for me. And I was like, I've skated long enough that like I could feel, I could feel the difference. It you had felt a, like Josh Kalis. You were like, yeah, <laughs> it had a different interplay, man. It felt really cool. So I'm like sold on it. Yeah. So, so I get my decks from life, little like wow. plug plug for Sam, you know? Yeah. But go check out Josh's Instagram. I mean, I seen the graphics. He printed them. If guys are out there doing good, you know, in the name of the yeah, Lord, yeah. go That's see. Right. So you, That's right. you're selling, so you're not a Christian, you're skating, you're selling what weed and just other drugs or what? That's kind of like testimony style. Yeah, or... Mostly just hippie, hippie drugs, you know, yeah, I yeah. Like, nothing like too intense mushrooms, weed, yeah, L LSD, that stuff, you know, which are not harmful, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. like, geez, man, you know, spiritually super destructive, you know, yeah. which really part of me coming to the faith, I think is like some of those farther out hallucinogens. Yeah. I didn't know the they, side of the story. Yeah. So let, yeah, let us know. Yeah. For those man who 
would think about dabbling because in some places they're legal or something like where you are all the way right? back or... to, yeah all, yeah michigan i live in michigan yeah. now so it's legal here it's legal where you're at you know mm-hmm. um just because something's legal doesn't change the nature of what it does to us you know like i remember back in yeah. middle school being in health class and looking at like the drug uh details you know yeah. and they would call marijuana a hallucinogen you know mm-hmm. because and not always but it can flip into like hallucinogenic qualities which Mm -hmm. is how like the medicine men and shaman in the far east would use it as like a supplement to spirituality so back when i used to smoke in high school and college i mean we would call it stone immaculate where we would purposefully smoke and smoke until we were like in another place i remember people doing that yeah old yeah so that was sort of my steez you know just like smoking smoking until you know, something yeah. opens up till you're getting visualizations and stuff. Wow. And at the time I was just a kid. So I didn't know I was like tampering with spiritual things. You just think like, Whoa, man, like, yeah. I remember being on acid. And like blown. the thing was, are you, are you seeing anything? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, no. like I'm getting visuals, you know, oh. but then in hindsight, we were opening, we were opening yeah. avenues to I, whatever I, I it was may about be. To say, portals which i almost cool. thought of. <laughs> yeah it's on the dungeons and dragons you something. thought you were opening, opening portals that's right man you know and there was i think there were ramifications you know it like yeah. i lived with low grade sort of fear and anxiety like after going to some of those places which is part of what like mm. brought me to the faith you know is needing yeah. freedom you know yeah well i did never like smoking anything because there's so many people in my family smoke they just gross me out but when i live with andrew jim I think Ali Bulala was with us, all those guys. I remember Brad Hayes bringing over like mushrooms or something. And in my mind, I'm trying to be all healthy, like, you know, raw foods, vegan back then. And I'm like, well, they're natural. So I remember three days in a row, we all did mushrooms. And the first day, like Andrew kind of freaked out. and was like, what am I doing? The next yep. day I freaked out. and was like, what are we doing? And then the third day, Greco freaked out. and was like, what are we doing? And to me, it was like the thoughts I had, the things I was seeing, what was going on, laughing on the floor. I mean, it was yep. a crazy. Experience, but I remember saying to Jeff Rowley, you know, I grew up with as a good friend. Yeah, but it's natural. He's like, no, it's a poison. Yeah. It's a poisoning yeah. your mind. It's killing brain cells as you're, yeah. you know, when you're taking that. So you're this skater kid. This is what you're doing. Were you raised in a Christian home or, you know, how, how do you yes. hear the gospel? Did you know it? Were yeah. You- yeah. I was raised in a, if you want to call it loosely Christian yeah. enough so that I think there was always there definitely was always this sense of like the answer is in the Bible, this Bible. Yeah, like yeah. this is, this is telling us about the true God, you know, even mm-hmm. though there was almost, I personally almost had no grasp on what it told me about him. Yeah. I wouldn't see, I wouldn't like seek it out, you know, and what does this have to say about him? I just had this sense that like the answer is in there somewhere. This holy know? book that's on the shelf somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to my parents' credit, like they would sit us down and do like Bible studies and stuff when I was, mm. when I was younger. So there definitely was some training more than a lot would receive, you know, the fact that yeah. there was something happening there, you know, Yeah. but when did it become real then? Was there an age where, like you said, you would just hallucinogens and living for yourself yeah. and yeah, you'd yeah. sing, but now you were the skater kid and then God really got a hold of you and you were like, okay. Yeah, so that was like freshman year in college. So when I was like 20, um, my older sister, Gayla, Mm -hmm. um, who's a visual artist, she lives in Seattle now with her husband and sons. She came to faith like pretty radically just Mm. like a year before me, maybe. And it was radical. You know, she was like sort of agnostic, heady intellectual artist, you know, um, who like God just. (laughs) <laughs> really took hold of her in a way that was perplexing to me honestly at the time as a kid like you knew your older sister i really looked up to was she in the back saw this change <laughs> i don't know i've not asked those questions no it's a long story how she came to me it's pretty intense so i'll let her tell wow it next episode but, um, yeah we'll get her yeah on. <laughs> man so you've but seen the was, change in hair yeah and so i went to the university where she was an art professor and she would invite me to go just to like an evangelical church it was a christian missionary alliance i don't know if you're familiar with them okay. cma um aw tozer he's one of the famous yeah. pastors from the cma you know yeah but she would invite me to go there after like sometimes three or four nights of like partying all night long you know really wow. had a drinking problem at that point um 
just as like a 20 year old you know was it yeah. like out of hand was, was starting to black out and wake up with blood on me and not know what happened and then i go to wow. church with her like stinking you know and it took like nine months uh, going with her wow for like the gospel to actually make sense and yeah to this day i don't always understand how the steps of someone coming to the yeah. point where they actually cross the threshold yeah because there were many sundays when i was there where I was like at the end of myself and the pastor would say, if you, if you believe this, bow your heart and just yeah. repeat this. And I was like wholeheartedly like, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I want this, mm. but no, nothing ever happened. Mm. Nothing, nothing ever happened. I mean, granted he was hearing that prayer, but like for months and months and months, nothing yeah. happened. And how I knew nothing happened is one, there was no sensation. Not that there has to be. Yeah. But I would like Wednesday of the next week would come around and the reality of God would just seem so distant you know what i mean yeah, I would just yeah. Be back to the races with my bros and then by sunday you know i've been out four nights in a row wow you know, crazy you know but yeah. then there was one there was one sunday where um it was actually the teaching on the lord in gethsemane yeah and the preacher said hey the lord like yes victory was on the cross but he won the victory internally in gethsemane if he hadn't made up his mind sweating and blood mm -hmm. in the in the peace of gethsemane before the guards even showed up he was coming to terms with what he had to do mm. and then the cross was merely him following through with the decision he already made and mm. for some reason that was like the magic god wow. key to my heart to make to make <laughs> it make sense you know where i was like i realized every week i was like lord give me strength to not fall again when party mm. time comes around next wednesday and thursday and friday and saturday you know give me the strength to like be good then and mm. he's saying no like he basically said today you choose mm. today's your day and then there was that again that internal impression or sense like if i yeah. don't choose to follow him today i'm not sure i'll survive yeah you're talking about partying for four days that's yeah i mean praise god you're alive yeah because i mean i've read waking... enough biographies man and yeah and not saying this definitely would have happened but there was this sense if i don't choose this i feel like my life is in danger mm -hmm. i might not have the ability to make this decision again mm -hmm. and i've read enough of these like you read about like awakenings and revivals and you have like the hooligans who are impressed but they put it off and then they don't have the chance mm -hmm. you know what i mean Welsh revival. Like, I think yeah sometimes when the lord impresses <laughs> like hey hey, hey today <laughs> you got to choose if there's someone listening and he's like hey 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 today like mm. follow through you know well that was through. our past episode was even just having alisa childers on was a real focus on the gospel and what's amazing though is even though we can say theologically you know it's the lord who does it all it is funny how people come to faith like yeah. for me it was very clearly looking searching almost believing but when he addressed the issue of sin i got it and it sounds mm -hmm. like for you you know, that, that picture of Jesus in the garden is very personal. When I realized, wait a minute, he swept blood. I've swept for people, but he swept blood for me and he made yeah. that choice. And when he says, you know, let this cup pass as any other way, I like to believe that's the reference because there's no other way. The only mm -hmm. way is by the cross, but yeah. the cross isn't really the focus. We preach that Christ and Christ crucified, but mm -hmm. the cross was necessary. That was the threshold to get Brian and Josh and everyone saved jesus is the focus you know what i mean yep. it's all about him those That's things right. were necessary for salvation so so god did that work you know if you want to challenge theology you made that choice in that moment or god elected and chose you yeah now what your life begins to change and what happens how do you go yeah. to i have a voice i can because you know we started with the question of even what was your musical influence it was rock rap now you're this yep. Christian guy with this radical safe sister. Yeah, yeah. How does God yeah. begin saying, I'm going to use this voice, you know? Yeah, so that first year, it was a radical conversion. So mm. one, I think he, he flushed things out of me and put new things in me. There was definitely <laughs> a lot of stuff happening, man, at that point. Um, wow. But that first year in the faith, I think some people could probably like um, – relate to this i feel like he fast-tracked me somehow i don't know mm -hmm. why but i felt like i got fast-tracked in that like immediately all these dudes who were five years older than me graduated architects and yeah. professors and guys running ministries all asked me to come live with them mm. i mean in hindsight to like mentor me you know what i mean so yeah. i went and lived with all these dudes who were like 
had been believers for years and were five years older than me, you yeah. know? Um, hmm. That's like every conversation, every discussion, these guys yeah, are right there kind they're of like in, they're coaching you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it even, it, there were some embarrassing things where I still feel like that first year I had some of the world was still on me. I remember sneaking out of the house to go to parties and then coming in and they were all sitting on the couch <laughs> waiting for me. And I'm like, <laughs> a little buzz and sitting down just crying and being like, man, help me through this. You know? So wow. like those guys were there when I needed those baby steps of like, Hey, mm -hmm. like, Hey, there's a better way, man. Come over here, sit down. You That's know? Amazing though. Yeah. Yeah. But that first year too, though, is when I realized music was a, like a thing. It had always been something I dabbled with, with mm -hmm. skateboarding and all my other interests. You know, it was just one of those things I did. It was in the mix with all the stuff that I like, yeah. you know? But it was a real solace, but it was also a very personal, private thing for me. So I would like close the door to my room and just sit with this acoustic guitar. And wow, it was it was all like between me and the Lord. I wasn't sharing those with anyone. I didn't have any plans to. It was all like mm. it was a tool that I was given to interpret this growing relationship with a living God. And yeah. I knew it, you know, and it was one of these guys I lived with who was like leading a ministry at the school there. Mm that like he was hosting some coffee house or something. And he's like, Hey, our act fell through. I hear you playing behind closed doors. Like, can you come and just play for 15 minutes? And I was like, well, they nope. knew exactly what you were doing. I mean, if they knew you were out yeah. partying, they knew when you were playing music as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, no, nope. but he kept pushing me. He's like, man, I hear you behind there. Like you're playing songs. Like uh. just try playing them for people, you know? And so I played this little college makeshift coffee house in some basement of some christian ministry in indiana you know for like 20 people or something yeah felt sick all day beforehand just in fear and mm -hmm. like you know man it was this <laughs> real like step of faith to do this little thing to take it out of like mm -hmm. just the intimacy with me and like god you know and i'm i'm not kidding you though i can chart that moment mm. to like because I played there, this person heard me like, hey, can you come play at this thing? Can you play at this wedding? Can you come play yeah. at the school here? Can you play at this universe? And then it like, literally mm. those first five, seven years of music for me was all just answering yeah. an invitation because someone saw me over here, over there. And mm. so, I mean, that's encouraging. You know, yeah. people will ask me, how did you know that you were supposed to? And I will say like, I don't know that it's going to be like this for everyone, but when I did this thing, yeah, it started in a quiet place in a day of small things. I had no anticipation of this becoming a vocation or something. And yeah. then out of an opportunity led to another opportunity led to another opportunity. And it, it was, it was fairly obvious on the front end down to like relative strangers showing up at my front door saying, Hey, my dad gave me this really nice acoustic guitar. Mm. You're supposed to have it, you know, like things like that would happen wow. over and over. Yeah, which I think that's is amazing. Like, God will give you little <laughs> clues like that, you know, when you're sort of stepping into something he has for you, you know, there'll be frustrations, there'll be things that don't go right, but you'll tend to look back and see, oh, man, there's breadcrumbs leading me all the way, you know? Yeah, you see the markers. I mean, you see what he's doing. And I feel like he opens those doors along the path as well. And it's, it's funny yeah. for you to step out. I've heard it said, you know, you really find your call by stepping into a place of serving so as you begin to serve someone, as you begin to serve with your gift, God extends that territory as well to where mm. I never thought I'd be on stage just sharing with people. I'm, and the fact that you're churning inside and you're scared, it almost just tells you, you know, it's valuable to you. It matters to you. Not just mm. that you don't want to be ashamed. You're, you're embarrassed to go sing. I mean, I have nightmares about singing to people, you know, but so you're now playing the music. And so are you singing your own songs or are you singing worship songs or what? Yeah, it was always from the beginning, it was always probably three quarters my own stuff. If I did covers back then, it was stuff mm. like Ben Harper or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Some folk <laughs> stuff that I was into, you know. Um, but yeah, it was predominantly my own stuff, even to this day, man. Like, mm -hmm. I do consider myself a worshiper, as I think, yeah, and in, in a like a broad, sort of universal way, we all are, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, we're all called to use our life to worship Him for whatever reason for whatever this is worth it's like entering into playing someone else's written worship song yeah learning it playing for a congregation 
I, I can do it. And I think there are times it could like be a service and maybe there's yeah. a need there for someone to play that role on a Sunday yeah. morning at the church I'm part of or something. But that is never, it's not out of like snobbery, like, oh, I don't do that. It's not yeah. that at all. I just have never felt like that has been my wheelhouse. Yeah, I really yeah. feel like that, that the Psalms that say like, sing a new song to the Lord, you yeah. know? And I think just... <laughs> new sounds are so intriguing to me the possibility of melody and writing and I like the something. creative side because because you know if i was preaching yeah. the night and i said hey the worship leader is sick josh grab your guitar you could go do that no problem and so how do you navigate that because this is what's an interesting question is i mentioned going to new zealand with josh harmony i remember going there and at the time there's this big christian festival and one of these bands that was just huge you know big christian band blowing up they had this kind of like invitation to speak and while they were speaking, a lot of what they said was just, you know, we don't really write Christian music. We really do this. We do that. We, we make it more secular. I get I get the whole yeah. thing for our listeners. Yeah. It's almost like I'm going to be the more secular, more Christian. And um, just what's your general if we're sitting on a plane talking, what's your approach yeah. to just music? You know, yes. some of them have built those pillars like it's always singing to the Lord or it's never that because we're trying to reach people. How do yeah. you? musician view yourself or maybe how yeah. yeah no that's a good question man that's a really good question yeah um one that I'm, i'll do my best i think about this all this stuff all the time and i have my yeah. like i have my maybe little like little triggers in there the things that when you talk about faith and art yeah parts of how people approach that that are like really irritating to me um yeah. <laughs> so you're a thing, snob in some ways in some ways you're like well yeah. I don't know. I, don't, I, I hope it's not snobbery, which yeah, is why yeah. I'm maybe prefacing with this because I'm I saying actually, our skate reference, how we're kind of yeah, like, we know the way yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. As I move forward, I actually like want to be more and more less pretentious myself and mm. actually less judgmental of others. <laughs> you know, if I can do both those things, be less pretentious, <laughs> be less judgmental. I would love to grow on both of those attributes, you know, <laughs> be praying for um, Josh this year and me. You <laughs> <laughs> That's right, man. But I think, forever man there's yeah. been this tension in a sort of faith or christian culture um yeah between like worship or secular music and how those are informed and i've been around so so many for so many years who would yeah. say that exact thing that those guys were saying from stage the sort of classic we're not making christian music we're just artists who are Christian. You know what I mean? Sort of this vernacular gymnastics yeah. to put them in a place, you know, where they're not lame. Yeah. But they love the Lord and they want yeah. to like yeah. figure out how to adjust your perspective so that you'll think more highly of what they're doing, which yeah. as always, man, from when people were doing it back then to now, it's a little cringeworthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where it's like, I remember watching this documentary made by Steve Albini's wife, mm -hmm. Steve Albini's wife. They were so intrigued with like underground Christian music mm -hmm. in like the early 2000s, late nineties. They Steve made Albini, a documentary about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's called why should the devil have all the good music, which is a lyric from not Randy Stonehill. I'm totally forgetting the old 70 rockers. Yeah, yeah. Name. You'll yeah. have a bunch of people write in. I can't <laughs> believe I didn't know. Comment but, below. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like, this is Steve Albini's wife. She doesn't believe, man, you know, yeah. but she, they're interested in this kind of microcosm of a subculture of Christian indie rock. So the yeah. days of like back then, like Pedro the Lion and Daniel Sun Family and mm -hmm. early Sufjan. And they were like, whoa, there's this weird little subculture wow. going on here. And where I came up was going to Cornerstone Culture or Cornerstone Festival in illinois for about 10 yeah. years as a new believer that's really where i got my start musically and they chose to go to that festival in particular and interview all these like mm. punk rock acts and you know what i mean to mm -hmm. like kind of produce this for everyone else this weird subculture documentary you know yeah sounds awesome i want to see it but there's this there's this scene there's this scene where she's at a bar with i think it was joy division i'm not sure but she's interviewing him at this dingy bar and she's interviewing them about the fact that they've toured with these acts that everyone knows are Christian, but these acts are desperately trying to make it in the world of critical acclaim and pitchfork music. And, mm. and so I'm not sure if it was Joy Division, forgive me if I'm wrong, but she's interviewing yeah. them saying, so what was it like touring with yada yada? They're like, oh, they're cool. And they're like, did you know that they're Christian? They're like, yeah. And then they all start snickering. And these dudes are like, man, it became a game to us. Yeah. in the green room to try to get these guys to say out loud that they were Christians. 
and oh they were like God. they were like the ways they would do these gymnastics because they were so scared of being affiliated with hmm. the body of believers because in the world of like yeah you know man skateboarding art like there's still you call your podcast foolishness yeah. because there yeah. is there is a stigma and there is a caricature that gets put on you immediately yeah when that word gets put on you you know mm-hmm. and so man of years of watching like higher education un- christian universities to the indie rock bands out on the road mm-hmm. desperately trying to sort of like yeah manage Navigate perception this. that i've i've come far enough to see that it's not fruitful it actually yeah. cuts out um any any of cultural authority that they would have hmm. because everyone else is like joy division in the bar they're like dude like Everyone knows you're a believer. <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows why <laughs> you're not why at the bar to... with us, or, or maybe yeah, you know that's what I mean? you're not saying. Jeez. You get hammered. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that that's sort of like my quick, maybe little soapbox in response to like that dilemma. Yeah. As as I've gotten older, there's actually been this sense of like, man, like I don't need to all of a sudden get annoying with it, but there's no reason to guise these things. In fact, like yeah. this, if this is the gospel, if this is the storyline that, despite people thinking it's foolishness. I know that it changes lives. Like, yeah. Why would I, yeah, try to guise that, or in and of myself think that I can like manage the perception of like the faith community in a way that all of a sudden is going to be like the magic key to awakening. Yeah. You know, like that's not how revivals have happened. It's yeah. through just like bold, simple <laughs> proclamation, speaking the language of the people. So I am passionate about that. I think yeah. there's a way culturally you can understand what's going on mm-hmm. and speak the language of the people um, create songs that the general public will at least give an ear to like, Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to listen to what this person has to say. You know, yeah, yeah. that's part of speaking the language of the people, mm. but not forever, man, doing this like perception sort mm. of like smoke screening and ninjutsu of like, how can we. <clears throat> well, because truthfully, are you yeah. really getting then to, live out your call it's like if you and me start a band at 15 you know and whoever signs us from nashville throws us on the stage here's what christians should look like here's what we're doing and we're up there just playing the part and we maybe miss even our gifting because now we're just trying to be successful musicians if that makes sense and then maybe it's the way the christian industry have approached all this you know i really want to write this book on evangelism, but I know if I go to a publisher, they're going to want it to be super relevant, super buzz, super hot topic. Like what's relevant today where I want to go right back to the core of man. Jesus came and this was his ministry. This is what the church is called to do. That call as an evangelist to get us back to discipleship and proclamation through music, through banking, through whatever you do. So, well, if I ask you a couple of questions, tell me the answer to this. Okay. Your favorite artist named Glenn? Glenn. Probably Glenn Kaiser, if I had to pick a Glenn. Do you know who Glenn Kaiser is? <laughs> no. So he's, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he's the lead singer of this group, The Res Band, which is okay. like classic rock Jesus uh, okay. movement music back in like the 70s and 80s. So yeah, Glenn so Kaiser, the, I'll say that one. Because the correct answer was Glenn Danzig. Um. <laughs> Ah. Kidding, I'm miss with skates. <laughs> um, favorite artist called Joey. Gosh, it shows you how many like first names of artists I don't know. The only one that comes to mind is like Joey Ramon. So we'll just That's go with the right that. Answer. <laughs> <laughs> favorite artist called Bruce Springsteen. Then okay, well you could have had Bruce Dickinson. This is yeah. a challenging one. Favorite artist called Robin. Ugh. And I'm only saying this because of what I watched the past week, which was crazy. <laughs> Not Robin Thick, I'll tell you that much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, who was it, man? I just had one. Yeah, because I didn't hear many, mind. and I couldn't believe this. So I, could, I think yeah. I think the lead singer of Fleet Foxes. I think his name's Robin. Robin. I'll go with that one. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Have you seen the Bee Gees documentary or no? Dude, I was in a hotel room driving my mother-in-law back to North Carolina. Probably yeah. saw half of it. So here's the thing: I yeah, never yeah. knew, like everyone i only knew the Bee Gees from like saturday night fever and then that song being covered by white cleft gene you know what i mean i never knew they were had like the mod cuts yeah and made like rip off beatles music yep that's what i'm saying i, I, I was like does josh man. know this <laughs> I yeah i didn't know they were english, english. 
<laughs> I thought they were. Yeah, awesome. dude. I didn't know they were brothers. Obviously, I didn't know anything about the Bee Gees, man. You know, it was a good documentary, though. Yeah, like well, just because the other guy with the crazier teeth, the crazier teeth, uh, Robin Gibb. I watched. Yeah. I was I was sick with a one hundred two fever. I put that thing on. I was like, I want to ask a musician. Do people know about these guys? Yes, we've heard of them, but I couldn't believe it. Um, okay, favorite artist called Josh. Hmm. <laughs> we'll say we'll say Josh Baldwin. Okay, you could have had Josh Harmony or even Josh White. We wouldn't oh, have accepted that... Josh Carroll's. I didn't even think about those dudes. Probably. Is you what you played worship? I listen to Josh White. I, I listen to Josh White a lot, man. So I would say the fact that he gets rolled in my house a lot and his solo stuff, man. You know, yeah. so I'll say I'll say Josh White. Thanks for yeah, bringing yeah, that yeah. one up. All right. And then who was your? I thought favorite? you were trying to bait me into like saying myself or something. I'm like, no, nah, no, no, no. <laughs> At forty, I think there's enough humility that you know, you know the mistakes we make. Anything we can say just flows. Then, and yeah. but who was your favorite <laughs> skater then growing up as well? You know, man, I'm 6'4". So okay, I didn't know that. I think because of that, I naturally, I was really drawn to like the tall dudes. Yeah. So honestly, probably Jeremy Ray. Okay. Back in the day, I don't even know if that dude's very tall, but he skated all like bow-legged. Six Is foot. he a tall dude? He's six Okay, foot. so he's a tall dude. Yeah. So, man, he was one. I can remember watching, was it yeah. Plan B, Secondhand Smoke? Yes. His part I, in that one. He like yeah. was the last one to skate. He had like the outro part the white um the white shoes 360 oh, flip side flip down yeah Carlsbad. yeah yeah man so i remember like that being like an almost like an existential experience like yeah. watching that over and over again so jeremy <laughs> ray was real big man i like i loved watching that dude skate yeah yeah and i'm really good friends with him i wrote for audio for years he just wrote yeah, on man. something yesterday um evan kazuvawa asked a question what was your best trick in your heyday skate trick hmm. As far as like technicality, probably just like kick flip back tail. I've you seen know? footage. That's... I've seen a couple of things you posted on your wall, and I was like, yeah. man, you guys got style. I was never it's... like super technical though. I think part of being tall, man, is like getting super mm -hmm. technical. They always called me pops because I just had a lot of pop. Okay. So I acted like Ollie trash can oh, standing trash up can. and stuff. So I was just like, I would just like do everything with big pop, but not super consistent at the same time, you know? Same. Um, let's see. Spin Black and Color Circle said, what are your top five musical influences? If you could pull from any genre or specifics that have influenced you, not just like, yeah. So I will preface this by saying I'm going to base that question just on sheer amount that I've listened to people throughout the years. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily, I mean, I listen to these artists now, but it means yeah. it was formative and there was a period where I listened to a whole lot of that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I will say early on the Beatles, I think they still play a part in how I choose to craft hmm. sort of efficient pop songs or something. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I think the Pixies mm -hmm. were a big deal for me, man. Again, they were like totally indie rock, but man, they wrote like, when I say pop song, I'm not talking like Britney Spears. I just mean like an efficient Mm -hmm. song that has like appeal you know like i think the, the pixies yeah yeah so pixies were a big deal had all their albums hmm. um maybe in the world of hip-hop i'd say like more than wu-tang i think gangstar was mm. like my guy so that's jazzmatazz guru and Premier. so yeah. gangstar was probably like the biggest in the world of hip-hop for me um as a new believer through my 20s, I feel like the earlier work of Sufjan Stevens was a really big deal. I'd mm -hmm. say all the way up, all the way up to about Illinois. And then I kind of stopped listening. He also just started producing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, that was a little harder to access. He's a, I, I don't know. I don't know. My wife, would, I mean, his Christmas stuff he did one year was like insane. So yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go back and listen to his older stuff, I mean, he went to Hope College here in holland mm -hmm. michigan which is like christian university his earlier stuff's pretty blatant pretty explicit you know mm -hmm. which i think was the appeal he was this picture of like oh he's making this really really interesting complex yeah. music that's not like anything and he's like talking about the transfiguration of christ and yeah so as a new believer i think the the merger of like sort of indie rock artistic excellence with someone mm -hmm. who's actually talking about things of the faith like i said those earlier albums are where he's doing that um but I paved I the way for, for you, years. though. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Earlier on, was like, I'm gonna try having a banjo in my music. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> he's doing that. Um, hey, one more, so or however. More. Yeah. If 
five. I'm trying to think of something like what's more recent, maybe yeah, last yeah. Decade so or I've kind of I've been going through like full full on almost decades with those first four. Good. When you start Let with the Beatles, here, you got the Suf Gen. He's gonna yeah be yeah. Let me think, man. So this is, traditionally this has been a really hard question for me to answer. Um, <laughs> I may have to come back to it. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, we just yeah. throw something out there. No, that's good. Honestly, man, I'd say like, yeah, I'm going to take a cop out. And this fine line from looking at the past decade of my life isn't necessarily an artist. It's actually like more genre in that like growing up as me and you have talked, I think music was such a mm -hmm. pillar of identity for me that in this past decade of my life, honestly, like recognizing the need for sacred music and worship music has mm -hmm. been very important for me and a huge liberation, you know, cause I yeah. think even as a young believer, there was sort of this snobby, like, I don't listen to good music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whatever that thing is. Yeah. And then there was this recognition as like a 32 year old in Portland, Oregon, going through a fit of depression, mm -hmm. me and my wife realizing this is a spiritual attack. It took us months to realize that. And then we prayed and we started listening to worship music in the house and wow. I mean, something changed. And from that moment forward, I've been like, babe, we need to like, we need to find worship music that we mm -hmm. like, and it needs, it's good for us. It's good for our household. Yeah. So I'd say number five, I would actually say that was a big transition for me realizing like the sort of unnameable transcendent quality of music that lifts up the name of the Lord mm -hmm. can actually like David's Psalms help lift you out of a state of depression like he would Amen. do that for Saul and the man like finding out the power of actual sacred music and worship music hmm. yeah I'll say that's number five so and that's true I mean if I get in a car and I can I mean obviously coming to faith it was more like Phil Wickham was playing I can just start singing those songs and it might yep. be the repetitive chorus mm -hmm. but I believe that you know yeah. what that song in Christ alone I know it was written only recently but I've yeah. said, man, at my funeral, play that song. I mean, it's so specific. Yes, yeah. you have the bubble of what's on Christian radio and the typical voice, but that's every genre, you know? So, and then someone had asked the question, what would you say really is your your life go-to verse? You know, the thing that like really drives you? Is there is there one or something specific for you that you go back to? Yeah. Um, I think the one that's been with me for years and years and I would still say is sort of the defining verses from Zechariah where it says, you know, not by might, not by power, but by mm -hmm. my spirit says the Lord. And I think as an early pastor, that was like how mm -hmm. I wanted to plant a church to the point of like not giving in to the pressure of people saying, Hey, you need to like start ministries mm -hmm. and you need to like mm -hmm. put all these things in place so that we look like a real church as I'm like 24 years old. I'd be like, <laughs> none of that stuff makes any sense we're going to get together and pray and ask the lord to do something you know but i'd say all these years later man um like anything i think that verse continues to open up new possibilities in the lord what does it look like in this year i'm moving into not by my might not by yeah. my power but by the lord's spirit and to see what he's capable of to say mm. lord i've seen what i'm capable of i'm going to stop now and i want to see what you're capable mm. of um mm. That's probably been the longest standing like uh, life yeah. navigation verse. I like yeah. weigh a lot of things against that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's been that, you know, as many as are led by the spirit of God or the sons of God in Romans 8, 14. But then it's funny as an evangelist, it's just like Ephesians 2, 10 workmanship, workmanship. Like I can hear myself in you when you're like, I'm getting up to do certain things each day. Like I'm excited for when we're done. Cause I'm purposely, it's 84 here in Cali. You know, I don't, I don't know what it is right there for you. Go to the like beach, relax. 29 degrees, man. We got, <laughs> we got snow outside. So. <laughs> I wish I was there. I mean, my kids have been dying to see snow. You know, we haven't been up in a mountain for a while. Yeah. Um, but Judd Heald asks, what's your favorite trick? Can I come build a ramp at your house? But seriously, I'd love to have an excuse to go hang out with Josh. And then Josh Garrels replied, yes, please. I need a little mini ramp in my backyard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was you Judd guys. Held, I remember, I remember watching Judd held videos back in the day, man. Mm -hmm. He's another one I remember following, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, cool. He'd say that, you know, yeah. I think my go-to trick would just be big backside on eighties, man. Either yeah. on a ramp or on a flat, man. I just like big, big lofty, backsides. Lofty. <laughs> yeah, six, man, four, boom. Suck your knees up. And just... 
Well, any, anything, I mean, what would you just, I guess, you know, I've probably took an hour or so of your time. What would you encourage Christians this year or even just musicians or anyone? What would you say heading into this year that you've learned, you know, in 40 years? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe even to s- continue uh, mm-hmm. the conversation from the very beginning of this interview, yeah. you know, that there is more to this life with Christ than you currently think there is Mm -hmm. and if you feel like you've been at a plateau or you feel like he's not speaking or you feel like um it's been so long since something Mm -hmm. like magical has happened with you and the lord there's there's so much more to the depths of christ you know Mm -hmm. Um, but i think something that me and my wife have learned as you've said as we've like been spending years and years now like pushing in is there is something to um again recognizing it's not our might it's not our power it's not our striving Mm -hmm. that's gonna like earn anything um from him yeah but there is something to the discipline of creating margin in your life to simply be in his presence like so i would tell people like in this time um where maybe we're a little more isolated from each other, but I think the ultimate Mm. temptation is to binge watch another set of TV shows to be on social media an hour more than you normally would to, you know, you all know what it is that tick of looking for like the red dot and Instagram Mm. or Facebook, you know, the little (laughs) proven adrenaline rush you get for being seen or having someone interact with you in this time where we're a little Mm. more isolated to take time to like put the phone in the other room, on the other side of the house and preferably first thing in the morning. Cause I'm mm. a firm believer that that's when our spirit is the most open and receptive after mm. like a decent night of sleep and like set before him and begin to ask basic questions mm. to him, open the scripture, yeah, take, take time. And you will see that there is a dialogue that begins between you and him. And you mm. will notice in time that, you start making decisions maybe even degree by degree Mm. in the direction that he's leading you in these times with him you know and Mm -hmm. it begins opening up frankly into like a deeper relationship with him you know Mm. um i've been reading colossians over and over man because in there it talks about the unsearchable riches Mm -hmm. that are in christ and it just uses this epic flowery language of like there's so much in him like Mm -hmm. it can never be exhausted and i will say i've tasted just enough over the years just enough (laughs) of those times where like he brings true peace to your heart true rest Mm. where he lets you know your purpose and your belovedness when he actually touches you with those things it changes everything it honestly Mm. changes everything just this past year man i like had these moments where i actually entered into his rest Mm. where i actually entered into his rest and in those moments that's when i came out to my wife even making a decision to kind of set music down for a year i told her if i could live in the presence of that peace i would it's worth everything then i would i would trade in everything everything you know (laughs) so but it takes it's not going to magically bang you over the head while you're binge watching a show on netflix yeah. The, the peace and rest of God, you know, it's not going to magically happen after an hour of like gorging ourselves with social media. You know yeah. what I mean? It actually takes being in a place where you're still and you're saying, here I am, Lord, I'm listening mm-hmm. and pushing through maybe a few times of feeling like you went to that place and didn't like leave with anything. You felt like you didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. Something's happening. Even allow yourself to feel the frustration of being still and mm. let, the distractions slowly like Mm -hmm. ease aside and you'll you'll realize he's waiting for you and Mm. the goodness and the treasures that are in christ i believe are like unsearchable as it says in colossians and they're the type of things that minister so deeply to the human condition and heart that Mm. it can change everything it could change everything and it will change the course of your life and Mm. the direction through 2021 so that would be my exhortation, man, to you and your listeners. It's just, <laughs> you're not going to earn anything, but take some time, create some margin in this time to push, mm. push away the distractions that are, that are begging us, the politics and the, 
the yes. fear mongering news and the mindless social media, you know, mm. like, Take some, take some distance from those, those things sometimes, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it is true. You know, you wake up and there's so many things coming at you. There's messages, there's things you've got to do. There's your job, there's family. A lot of those things are good, but when do we withdraw with the Lord? And if you mm -hmm. want to hear God to our listeners, just be honest with yourselves. When is the last time? I mean, here's Josh talking about Jesus. Go read Colossians, see who mm -hmm. it's written by, see who it's written to, see the context, but take those truths and, and I've often thought this, you know, it's like when you first hear a song and you love it and you're like, I, you know, that it's going to wear off a couple, a couple thousand more listens and it's done. But that feeling of like, wow, or as you first fall in love or the levels go deeper or you see your marriage mm -hmm. peaking over time, that really doesn't come close to what is always there in the Lord. And mm -hmm. there's just been moments for me where not that it's a word from him, it's a word maybe I'm thinking of, or maybe it's something he's impressed on me or a verse that's affirmed. Or, you know, when I'll go preach a lot of times, I'll go into a church. I'll be up since six in the morning preaching at eight. I don't know the church. I go in and then you might be the guy worshiping. But as I begin to hear the worship, God begins to make me see what I'm doing there that day and what he's mm -hmm. doing. And that just shakes me. And for me, that's almost like my quiet time. It's going even in public and being with the Lord. For our listeners, guys, don't let the politics, as Josh said, don't let the, you know, the diagnosis, I get this world falling apart and things are going to happen, but you already have eternal life in Christ. If you're his, you already won, as I've said, mm -hmm. prior to the eternal lottery. And that even leads us to the point, maybe you're listening to this and you go, man, what are these two guys talking about? We've <laughs> never even met, but we're sitting here talking about Jesus, a guy that's written in a book, it's printed ink, but this has been the story of God from creation to the book of Revelation. And if mm -hmm. you don't know Jesus Christ, this is as simple as it is. We both have talked about our prior lives. We know we've all sinned. We've lied. We've lusted. We've hated. We've gone our own way. Even Josh had said he's out there selling drugs. He's living for himself, even knowing what he should have done. But the goodness of God invaded in a church, the goodness of God invaded in my life in this room to my side, where I still live to this day, man. Wow. I mean, the goodness of God is invading in your life through a musician and a skateboarder. And if that's the case, the message is simple. The Bible tells us we're to repent and believe the good news. The mm -hmm. good news, we're all going to die. We've got some sin that God's going to take. He lived, died, resurrected, and he took Josh's sin and Brian's sin, and he put him on that cross. Josh talked about the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus counted the cost, and he looked at us with love. And yes, he's getting glory, but he was going to die. The Bible says in Hebrews for the joy set before him, yep. he bore that cross. He saw Josh. He saw this podcast. He saw you listening. He died and he resurrected, not just to defeat death, but to prove to us he's alive today. So if you are listening, I hope this has sounded so foolish to you that it is foolishness, but now the spirit of God as the wind moves is ministering mm -hmm. your heart and you can freely receive. We're living in a world where Josh could have chased stadiums and chased platforms, or I could be chasing whatever it could be. We did that in many ways, but we've won because now we're in Christ. And all this is, is it's a guy, whether he picks up his guitar or not, he's going to follow Jesus. It's a guy, whether he's on the podcast or he's going to go preach today, I'm going to follow Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that if you believe you'll have eternal life, our prayer is that you know that God, that you trust in the work of Jesus and that you'll escape what's to come in the next realm when we die and we're going to be found guilty and we can escape that through the blood of Jesus. So guys, Amen. if God is dealing with you, ministering to you, open up the way, the spirit does all the work. We're just vessels hanging out. I know we've been on longer than forever, but how do people get a hold of you? And then I want you to pray us out when we're done with that. But what's the best way to connect with you? Yeah. I mean, probably the socials, man. Instagram, yeah. Facebook. <laughs> you can go to my website, joshgirls.com, if you mm -hmm. want to like send a personal letter, email. Amen. That so you'd prefer that. Yep, you can go there. And then would you just pray us out and just say whatever's yeah. on your heart for a moment? Yeah. Lord, man, thanks so much for this time and just spending it with Brian. And it does speak something, Lord, that when I can meet someone for the first time and talk for an hour plus and find such commonality, Lord. Um, that's your spirit, Lord. And your church is made up of your people, not this building or that building, but 
when two or more to gather together like yes. this, your spirit is present. And I, I know that like you led conversation um, in this time that we're able to give our story, our testimony. And I pray that, you know, even those listening, there could be this nugget, a little key that opens something that you've been longing to open in someone's heart, Lord. Um, as I know, sometimes it just takes uh, the right move of your spirit, the right scripture, um, someone giving a testimony to make it make sense to someone new. So mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, for the listeners that whether they've been walking with you for 50 years or mm. they're right on the cusp, that you draw them in to this yes, time God. with me and Brian right now. Um, man, and let your will be done. I pray mm. for Brian and his family, Lord, that you just provide for them and Jesus. continue to bring meaning, wholeness, health, um, mm. purpose to their family, Lord. All the work that Brian and his wife are doing. Watch over their kids. Let them grow healthy and strong. Uh, in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, thank you all for tuning in. I know we consider it a privilege. And Josh, um, I'm sure our listeners who are faithful, I have people that go back to episode one like, and listen every day. We're almost at 100 episodes. Guys, cool. be praying for Josh and um, his family, his leading, what he does with your music and with your preaching, if that's it. And, you know, mm -hmm. we don't know when it, this is all going down, but while we're here, we're invincible till he returns. The spirit mm. of God is powerful to raise Jesus from the dead and he's with us. Don't fret. Don't fear our faith. So Josh, thanks for your time and yeah. we'll stay in touch. So God bless you all. And remember the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power, power of God. God. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.